Hello everyone, welcome to the Jargus Range Review. This time we'll be looking at the 14th episode of Power Rangers Beast Morphers, Sound and Fury. Alright, now I'm going to be discussing matters a little bit out of order, because elements of this episode were all over the place, but it's still made of cohesive whole. But to review it requires just breaking this down into different chunks. First of all is our monster of the week, it's Dubatron! He's back! 2.0, except this time Blaze uses a red gem called a Fury Cell. And it glows with a lot of red energy. And no, he doesn't power them up in the cyber dimension. No, instead he does it right in front of rangers. To which of course, Nate and Steel go after him to get the others because he has a total of four of them. While the brothers do defeat Blaze, they only secure one of the Fury Cells. And he escapes back to the dimension with the other two. Now the upgraded Tubatron is incredibly powerful. It defeats the other three rangers easily, to the point where their weapons break, and they even force demorph. But not before Devin gets hit so hard directly by his sound blast, that it actually cracks open the visor in his helmet. So yeah, this one is really powerful, and they escape by having Cruz get Ravi and Zoe away, while Devin blasts it for a distraction with his uh, blaster, and then runs away with his cheetah speed. So round one did not turn out too well for the rangers at all. However, Nate thinks that he can use the fury cell to finish some new upgrades for the red ranger. Mainly the cheetah claws, which we've seen glimpses of already. As well as a new armor mode. Now he says that the armor should be ready by the time Tubatron returns. But the cheetah claws have not been properly tested yet. But Steel says he's confident that it'll work. Because it's Nate's doing it. Of course he just thinks that. <laughs> So in round 2, yeah, Tubatron's uh, sound blasts are still extremely powerful, and it takes a moment for the Fury Cell to activate the Red Fury mode for Devin. And he doesn't look all that different. You see bits of red armor go on top of him, which really blends in, and really just makes him a little more bulky. But parts of it are metallic, and that looks alright. Overall, you can't tell a whole lot of difference with Devin looks, especially when he's moving in action. Oh, but you can see it. I mean, there's a burst of energy field that knocks everyone back when he transforms with it. And he's able to beat up Tubatron just by hitting him with punches and kicks. He don't even need to use his regular weapon. But he does transport the Cheetah Claws anyway, and he's able to slash right through him. Devin even steals the show for the Megazord battle. Because there is no Megazord, it's just him and the Racer Zord. Because the other two just had their equipment damaged too much for them to be called. And Devin also quickly defeats it with the Sword Slash. Not too much there. And this was not even a Devin episode, as far as the non-action goes. But before that, let's go back to the Cyber Invention. Because at the beginning of the episode, we found out that Blaze found the Fury Cells. They were Scrozzles, and that they were the last four in the universe. After Scrozzle was in the middle of telling Roxy a bit about Vargoyle and how he escaped. But that gets cut off, so we still don't know anything about Vargoyle. But considering that he still exists in the Cyber Dimension, and now they're talking about him again, it probably gonna show up pretty soon. But the question is, is he a threat to Evox, or is he gonna be a threat to the human world? Or is he gonna be a threat to both, an enemy to all sides? Or are our villains going to work together with Scrozzle as our connecting point? Who knows, I'm interested in finding out who and what Vargoyle is. Because so far, the only residence we've seen of there is, well, Scrozzle. We don't really know where Evox came from, whether he was born from the Cyber Dimension or somewhere else. That's really never been made very clear in the show so far. So I'm interested in seeing that. But now comes the serious part of the episode. And this is a lot more serious as far as character development goes than we've seen in the season so far. Before any of this action goes down, Zoe is helping Nate pick out a new lab assistant. To Will. Assist him. So they're doing interviews, and, if, and the only one we really see is the head of Zord Maintenance, a great battle force, which is a girl named Megan. And you can tell from the look on his face that Nate does not seem very thrilled about her, even though she seems very eager. Of course, Zoe doesn't show this. She means pretty calm and professional, as you should as an interviewer. Now, but later we see Zoe buying a movie ticket, only to come up behind Nate, who was just about to see the same movie. So they decide to watch it together. And this was perfect. It's called Revenge of the Hydra Worm. The Hydra Worm being one of the first monsters fought in Power Rangers Mystic Force. Even the art on the poster they made for it is pretty similar to how it actually looked in that season. That was pretty clever. I mean, just a couple episodes ago, we got callbacks to Mighty Morphin. Now we have callbacks to Mystic Force. 
I wonder what other subtle references to other Rangers series that I just haven't grasped yet. Now when they're coming out of it, the two are just playing around with popcorn, and Megan just happens to be there by the side, so she decides to record them with her smartphone, as people are known to do these days. Now skip forward to after the return to Grid Battle Force, after the first encounter of Tubatron 2.0, Commander Shaw tells Nate to put his new lab assistant to use. Of course he hadn't of course he had not yet picked one out yet, so he had Zoe to do it because he knows he can always count on her and that she's a good judge of character. The problem is, just after that, Zoe bumps into Megan and she blackmails her into making her the assistant. Or she'll report to the commander that the two rangers were on a date. Which as we know from Ravi at the beginning of the series, has a big infraction at Grid Battle Force. Makes you wonder why though. I mean Zordon was okay with it. Time Force was okay with it. Indirectly, Lightspeed Rescue was okay with it. <laughs> then again, Commander Shaw thought that playing music was a silly distraction. Who knows what she thinks about romance for Avenger. Hell, even Keeper and Kendall were okay with it. Anyway, back to what happened. So yeah, she gets made the assistant. Though you can tell by his tone of voice that Nick don't quite believe it, but he trusts in Zoe's choice. Problem is, Megan has not yet done her scheming. She tries to say that she thinks the calculations for the Cheetah Claws are not correct, but Nate says he's very sure that he calculated the math perfectly. And so while he's finishing powering up the armor for the Fury Cell, he instructs her to put half a bottle of the Morphex fluid into the Cheetah Claw. Only half, not a drop more. Of course, this conniving woman dumps the whole thing in there and drops the bottle in the trash can. And so, when they try to test it out, it overcharges with power and it just flies across the room, cutting up the clothes for Ben and Betty, leaving them looking tattered. And considering how one slash of that from the Red Ranger could destroy a Robotron, it probably could have killed them if it was actually aimed at them. The deceitful wench then proceeds to inform Commander Shaw that Nate is out of control that he can't handle both being a ranger and being head of the science lab, and that she should be the one in charge of the lab. And then Zoe comes in in a bit of what when Shaw asks her to bring Nate in. But that's unnecessary because Nate himself barges in and he's going after Megan's head. Cause he reveals to everyone that she put the entire bottle in on purpose. Cause he found it lying down. And he doesn't understand why Zoe picked her. And that's when it gets revealed that she saw him on a date, and Shaw is really unhappy. She says, you blackmailed two rangers and threatened to make it public just to get a job? And she, and you could tell, like, she looks so mad at her, she was just gonna devour her whole. But, being a high-ranking military official, no. She stopped herself. She could stay composed and just told her to get her things and get out. She was fired for good. And they insisted that it was just a coincidence that they happened to be at the same movie, and the commander said that she trusts his word. And from then, we had the second round of battle. Now, in the aftermath of things, Nate and Zoe are getting drinks at the juice bar at the gym. They're not together, just one shortly after the other. So they start talking about what happened. And one thing Nate questions is that why Zoe didn't deny that they were on a date. That's because that she says she kind of likes Nate. And so to her, meeting up there kind of was like a date. Because she actually went there on purpose. Because she knew he was going to it. Then Nate reveals that, yeah, he kind of like likes her too. It's kind of cute how they're both really nervous and don't know quite how to articulate it. <laughs> ah, to be young. So they're talking about things and just what they're supposed to do, what should they do. Meanwhile, Ravi and Devin are seeing them talk from a distance. They can't ever hear them. And they just blow it off. They don't think it's possible. They don't see that connection. And oh yeah, Nate spills the beans that he's the one that gave Zoe those flowers on Valentine's Day. You know, I forgot all about that episode from months ago until they brought it up just now. That was very clever. <laughs> so this leaves me very interested. I mean, because this episode had character development for two of the Rangers and their relationship to each other and the fact that it can be a problem going forward. I just noticed that they're both similarly colored gold and yellow. <laughs> Just an observation at this moment. Will this be a problem for them? So who knows what's gonna happen? I mean, it may go nowhere, like little references here and there, much similar to Shelby and Tyler back in Dino Charge. But this is way early in the series. We're not even this in this but this is way early in the series. We're not even on the second season yet. And already we're having them connect this closely to each other. So who knows? I mean a forbidden workplace romance between two warriors that are a part of a military organization as well. 
I mean, there's a lot of ways they can go with that. Even the possibility of one of them resigning. So yeah, and, and as for Megan, she got what she deserved. I mean, yeah, she can do maintenance on a machine that's been built already and put in action. But what does she know about being a scientist creating new machinery? And remember, this is a government facility with top secret weapons information. And she's gonna sabotage something like that? I can do more than get her fired. She's gonna be a big trouble for felonies, for putting the public in danger. Because if the Rangers cannot use the equipment because of her personal shenanigans, then that's a whole nother mess that she's created and could be held accountable for a lot of stuff. So yeah, this was a really good episode, both in terms of the action, which this time is totally divorced from the non villainated story. I have no idea what kind of words I was trying to use there. And a story involving the Rangers personally got very serious very quickly and shows a pretty deep potential to develop even further. So I want to see how far this goes. I also want to see what Vargoyle and these Furious Cells do, as well as if we're going to see more of the data chip. Because of course Scrazo is pissed at Blaze because he took those cells into action when he was hiding them and lost one of them, or technically two of them. I have a feeling Scrozzle might betray Evox. I have a feeling Scrozzle might betray Evox if Fargo ever shows up or he sees an opportunity to separate himself from all of them. Evox gets annoyed at their failures, but Scrozzle takes them personally because it's his Robotrons and his Giga Drones that are getting destroyed by the Rangers because of their conflict. So I would like to see this develop into something bigger and not just something thrown in towards the end. Like I hope, so anyway, we have a lot of ongoing plots to develop on. I hope the next one really expands them to make it even more interesting. Cause this is definitely a great episode to watch, especially if they push it even farther in the coming episodes. I do give it an A. Now this has been Jargus. Thanks for watching. And until the next episode, let the power protect you. It's more than time for justice we fight.